Carson, Leno, Fallon. Now, it's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we're at an away game today, way away up in the Spring Mountain, about to have a conversation with Elizabeth Tangy with Cornell Vineyards. Introductions in just a second. Wine Talks, of course, available on iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you hang out for podcasting. And a shout out to the Vintage House in Yauntville. A great place to stay. If you ever come to, to Napa Valley and visit the wineries and restaurants, right across the street or down the street from the French Laundry is the Vintage House. It's a great place. They always take care of us up there. And hey, I got a podcast coming out in a couple of weeks with Maureen Downey, the preeminent authority of fake wine. Yes, there is fake wine in the world, and she is the authority on finding them. Have a listen to that coming up. But not while we're here. I, I'm thrilled to have a conversation with Elizabeth because she is the director of winemaking and viticulture here at Cornell Vineyards, which is way up in the Spring Mountain. But welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is really going to be fun. I hope so. I mean, because, <laughs> well, I'll try to make it fun. No, just driving up here, I got this amazing sense of uh, of terroir and um, a history and just the Napa Valley, kind of what you'd think Napa Valley would be like when you got here originally. What what got you to Cornell Vineyards to do this? Well, first and foremost, the Cornells, the owners of this property, Henry and Vanessa Cornell, they brought me up here. They're lovely people, and they're the reason I'm here today. But beyond that, the wines and the terroir are impactful and beautiful and something I wanted to be a part of. It's a, it's a, actually the vista just right here in the winery is phenomenal, isn't it? I, we noticed driving up, though, that there's a lot of scorched trees, a lot of timber. You know, the fires have been devastating the last, was it 2018 and 17 or 1918? Did that, I mean, tell me about that just a minute, what the stress level was like when this was happening? Oh, goodness. Well, in 2020 is when the fire came through our property. And in that year, I had my first child. So, oh. blessing. Whoa. Uh, but then there was also COVID a week later after I had my first child. And then on the flip side of the year, the fire ran through our property and covered pretty much all of it. So I'd say in ranking of stress, it was the glass fire, my newborn. And if I had time to worry about COVID, I did. That's unbelievable. I mean, that's seriously <laughs> unbelievable. It was a tough year. <laughs> and so... With, with these vineyards we're looking at today were here. Yes, they were here and they survived. So we have 20 acres of vineyard planted. Mm -hmm. uh, we had six acres under replant, so had just been planted in 2020. And when the fire ripped through, because they're so tiny and unprotected, we pulled them all and replanted them. And then we lost about another four acres of mature vines. That's amazing. That were completely scorched and we knew right away. So... This year we have, we're very close to finishing that replant and have most of our vines back in the ground. We have a couple small blocks that we're feeling out that we will replant next year. And then we'll be back in action. Unbelievable. And all Cabernet? No, we have um, Merlot. We've always had Merlot. We have it again. Uh, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, Petit Verdot. And then we took the opportunity to plant some Carmenere and some Chardonnay. Mm. So all Bordeaux varieties, you know, Carmenere can be argued as a Bordeaux variety as well. Can. And then Chardonnay, it's kind of cool. Actually, today I had a podcast with a woman making wine in Ohio. And I said, what are you making? And she says, Chardonnay. Oh. You ever heard of this? Nope. <laughs> Chard I haven't. I'm like, Chardonnay. <laughs> I'm interested to taste it just because, you know, the pre-prohibition and post-prohibition, that's where we grew wine in America. And this is some interesting varieties that we've never tasted here, but I thought it was interesting. So your, your, your bio says that you're director of winemaking and viticulture. So you're in charge of what's in the vineyard, which is where it all starts? Yes. So myself and my five vineyard guys manage the vineyard on a daily daily basis. And the guy ran over me with the tractor almost? Yes, yeah, okay, that's good. the guy. So uh, <laughs> we have an excellent supervisor, Javier. He takes care of the crew, um, follows the direction that we set, and gets everything in tip-top shape. Wow. Are you here every day? I'm here most of the time, so we make wine off-site, and so I'm there a lot of the time tending to that, but otherwise I'm here. For the listeners, we're way up in the hills, and it's a beautiful, beautiful drive and a beautiful vista, as we as we already discussed, but, um, you know, it's it's a task just 
to get here. Is there tasting room traffic? I mean, so many people live on the tasting room traffic. Right. Yeah. No, we don't have that traditional tasting room traffic. Yeah. It's We're way off the beaten path. So, what, is, what was the objective of the Cornells to do this in the first place? So Henry has always had a love affair with California wines. And um, back when he was single, he had just moved back to the States and he was looking for a property in California. I think he imagined he would move out here one day. He found this parcel and fell in love with the site. There were remnants of pre-prohibition vineyards that had been planted. They weren't currently here. Um, so he purchased the property and started developing the first 20 acres. And since then, he's expanded the property to the entire road on your way up. Um, several different houses that our vineyard crew lives in. And he also, throughout the course of that process, met his wife, Vanessa, proposed to her here. So wow. it's become a very <laughs> special property in, yeah. their, in their family. Since then, they've had five children and they come out here from time to time. And it's sort of their you know, West Coast project, and um, they're they, back where, in New York. Where was he before he came? Um, he was traveling around, but he did a lot of work in Asia and I see, okay, um, I was moving back to the States, but he lives in New York with him, his family and his wife. And you started, your love affair with this started when you were studying French? So my love affair with wine and culture and food and all the good things in life um, came from my study of French. So Throughout that process, I visited France several times. I sort of, the pace of their lifestyle seeped mm -hmm. into my bones. And I just think they do it a little bit better than we do. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, my Sandra will agree, I'm a bit of a Francophile. Yeah, exactly. And so it's, you know, it's inspirational. Let's talk about that for a second because it's uh, culturally obviously very different. But one thing about their culture, which I sort of envy but at the same time, the French envy our culture because of the opposite. And the, what I'm saying is the, the control of Appalachians, the, the restrictions put on the wineries to reflect where they're from. The food is protected, the butter, the cheeses. And I am, I'm envious of that because we don't, and Americans don't have that. Yeah, we're free as a bird out here. So I know. We do what so, we want. <laughs> I mean, is that inspiring to you with the French, how they protect uh, us? Or? That's not something I'm particularly drawn to. I, I did a harvest over in France, and I do think everything over there is much more systematic. They have, you know, years on us. Yes. They've developed what works best. But I think it's also cultural in, you know, you don't necessarily grow up in France free to do whatever you want. There are cultural expectations True. that in the United States, you dream it up and then you go do it. it there are no restrictions on what you can achieve. And I admired that about United States, it's that level of freedom is amazing. You can blend Cabernet and Syrah. You can wow. <laughs> blend whatever you want and grow whatever you want. And I think in California, especially, we have such diverse terroir and microclimates that you should be free to do what you want. Well, so. that's why they come here, right? The you know in the Lama Valley, there's tons of French making Pinot Noir, the Burgundians, yep. and and uh, but I, I have this the romantic side of that culture, which is. You, ex you know, there's expectations wherever you go. So in America, we lost our regional foods, for instance, in, in general, uh, with the highways. And, you know, you can go to Howard Johnson's in New England and have a hamburger and it tastes the same as the one in, in the West Coast. Which is not, I'm saying it's a problem. But, mm -hmm. And we're getting that, we seem to be getting that back. Uh, and experimenting with foods, being farm to table, trying to put together cuisine. The Napa cuisine is one of those examples, which is sort of that fresh, take on on old cuisine, right? Sure. So with 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 grape with winemaking, what's your what's your goal to express? Well, my goal is always to be light-handed. So I think we lose some of our terroir not because the grapes don't have it, but because once it's brought into the winery, we have resources that tend to overshadow the wine. I also think in California, we have an abundance of sunshine. And I always say it's my most difficult thing to monitor or to, to, to minimize because with that amount of sunshine, we have higher alcohols and you lose some of the nuance mm -hmm. in wine. Mm -hmm. But I do think our grapes in general have beautiful terroir. And if you can bring it into the winery and let that come through, we'd have it. It's just that 
in California and the United States, we have a lot of resources and that means oak and that means manipulation and that means, you know, heavy handed extractions. And so you, you said Candace. In the very beginning, you said, I want to be like Candace or Candace. No. No, what? I don't know what you're what? referring to. <laughs> I wrote down the word Candace. Light-handed. Oh, light-handed. Yeah. Because, no, somebody told me about a woman make, that's known for her acid structure, and I thought her name Name's was Candace. Candace? Yes. <laughs> so. No, light-handed. Just that when I come into the winery, I want, um, I want the fruit to express. I do want mm. the vineyard to express. And what I find beautiful about this site, over the vintages— it's such an impact what comes from here, the herbaceal notes, the sage, the, you know, light and integrated black cherry and and tobacco and peat. It's so heavy. I mean, the terroir is such an imprint that even if I brought it into the winery, it would be hard to mask that. So when we taste, you know, 2013 all the way to 2019, you see that property come through in every single vintage, even when the blend changes. And I love that about this site. So if I would do a vertical, what, what's their first vintage? 13. Okay. I uh, went to a tasting today, a lot of, you know, like seven or eight total enophiles, you know, they like to sit around and massage wine in their mouth and tell each other how much they know. And, um, but there was a vertical and it was a very expensive vertical. I uh-huh. think this host probably spent seven, eight thousand dollars on wow. these seven wines. And they're all trying to figure out what it was. Is it a blend? But I said, you know, this is a vertical. This is clearly somebody's hand in these last, and it went back to 1986, I think, up to 2016. But to me, it was like you could taste it. And when, I'll tell you where it was from. It was Australia. It was the Grange, the Penfold Grange. Mm. But the the thing that they couldn't figure out was, was, was this one person in, in one vineyard. I go, there's no question about that. And I, I'm thinking that's what you want, that 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 vintage that terroir for that year, that time, that place, that moment mm-hmm. is expressed by Elizabeth. Yeah, exactly. And so that we're not playing with the wine to figure out, to make the wine that you want to make. Right. Yeah, so I would correct that statement a little bit and just say, the like the wine I hope to bottle is a wine that says Cornell Vineyards mm-hmm. and maybe doesn't say my name. Not because I don't want, well, not I because I'm not right. proud of it, That's not because I, mean. I don't want my no, name no, out I get, there. I but say, right. The point is, if you can taste my signature, then I haven't expressed the right. terroir. And that it comes from, okay, so let's take this example. And I've used it twice today already, but it's something new. And that is, if I take the same winemaker and I put him, and you've been here 20 years, let's say, and you've been making vintages from the same vineyards and you're, for 20 years, and I take a winemaker who's been traveling the world, you, you, you did a harvest in France, Maybe you did a harvest in Australia, you did one in New Zealand, maybe you did one in South America. And I gave the same grapes to this, those two winemakers. We're going to get two different wines. Thinking. Mm-hmm. One's not better than the other, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, is is that because we're trying to express ourselves, somebody might be trying to express themselves, or that we're actually truly trying to get out of the soil and out of the grape what? And it's just two different opinions. So it's an interesting question. If you, you're saying you take the same fruit and you give it to two different winemakers, do they make it in the same facility? Question. Do right. they use the same yeast? Question. So well, that's a good I question. think those are impactful things. Yes. Facility, yeast, you know, how they do pump overs, how do they do the extraction? So not necessarily the winemaker so much as basically the winery terroir. Mm-hmm. You know, as you get into, you take those two grapes in totally different directions. Have they been trucked? You know, have they been... Cold soaked, yeah, have they been extracted or long macerated? Then what kind of oak are you putting them right. in? So if you told the parameters to the two winemakers, mm-hmm. use this yeast, use this facility, and use this oak, I think you'd get pretty similar wines. Pretty similar wines. Yeah. It's an interesting question for me just because I think sometimes the experience of the winemaker or winemakers that touch the grapes are going to have a different opinion. And one of the conversations I had yesterday was that it happened at been to bottle where they brought in some Riesling and they were completely, no, it wasn't Riesling, it was another grape. But anyway, they had two different versions completely. One winemaker wanted the oak and all that stuff and it was a different expression. And, I, and I'm just of the romantic side of wine, which is let's express the terroir. Let's figure out where this stuff is from. Because I don't, do you think that happens in, in Napa Valley enough? The terroir <laughs> you know, showing through? Yes, exactly. That, there's enough wine making where that's the objective. It might be the objective, but I think we stumble 
with how many resources we have. And I think we stumble a little bit with how much oak we use. That's a huge problem mm -hmm. because, well, I'm not going to name names, but, you know, the, I would say that most consumers of wine would not understand the terroir in general of Napa Valley, the difference between Rutherford and Oak Knoll and, and Spring Mountain as compared to the brands that are on the shelf that everybody drinks that pay a lot of money for them mm -hmm. that are kind of expressionless really when it comes to that. You think there's distinct, like obviously mountain fruit, no problem. Yeah. Distinct Napa Valley characteristics amongst the Appalachians? Oh, I do. Absolutely. I mean, it may not show in every single wine, but I think you can certainly taste the terroirs and the differences. So are we at odds with expressing what's here and what people are buying on the shelves and the big distributors are pushing? Not sure I understand the question. I mean, I think that people would love to drink the wine that is being expressed, you know, the terroir that's coming through, but it's expensive. I mean, our farming costs here are, are a lot. And so it's not necessarily reachable for everyone. It and, you know, expensive. the wines that are, are blended together from different areas in Napa that are maybe a little bit more accessible, still fantastic, but don't necessarily come from one vineyard who's, you know, doing 15 hand passes mm -hmm. a year mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. vineyard. So it's all about where you can reach. And so where are the Cornell wines? Are they club related? Do you have a lot of devotees that... We do, yes. We are very lucky. We have a strong uh, collector circle, which is where we sell most of our wines mm -hmm. um, direct to the consumer. And then we're here and there. We do a little bit of wholesale on our Cornell Estate Cab. Really? Yeah. I haven't seen it in Southern California. So <laughs> So it's out there, but it's mostly going to be restaurants. So tell me about that, because COVID was stressful for you both personally and in, in, in your career. But it was also from the wine business, particularly on-premise wine, it was really devastating to, to the wines. Did the Cornell suffer through a sales issue during COVID? Contrary to popular belief, people were at, were at home and drinking wine. Yeah, no, we did really well. My company did really well. Yeah, we sold some wine, and we're super grateful that people were at home and drinking wine. Because you had, well, <laughs> because, well I could sell anything I wanted to during COVID. I mean, I was like... My average price for bottle of just uh, is twenty bucks. That's what I used to sell wines for. Uh huh. And they were buying anything. They were buying Camus at one hundred and forty five dollars. But the day after COVID was over, it like stopped. I mean, uh -huh. literally plummeted. It was yeah. crazy to watch the sales graph go. But that, a lot of wineries, particularly Napa wineries, more popular ones in the sense of volume, were devastated by the on premise uh, sales going to zero, effectively going to zero. But well, our sales team did a lot of creative things. I know a lot of other wineries did them too, but I, um, we mailed samples out. People tasted in their home via Zoom with our salespeople. So we found ways to reach our customers and we have that strong collector circle. So we stayed connected. And, you know, people weren't going to restaurants. They were drinking at home and cooking at home and it worked out. It's, it, was a, it was an interesting part of our career. It was an interesting chapter, I'm sure, for and, everyone. And, you know, the restaurateurs decided to cut back on their inventory and they don't carry as much now. They're not buying as much as they did. Uh, the consumers went right back to where they were going or what they were doing. I mean, I literally, my sales were below 2019 when the COVID was over. Oh. One of the reasons we sold. Uh, so, <laughs> no, but it was... New career path. <laughs> yeah, new career path, new podcasting. Um, did you have any headwinds to your career uh, because the women in wine is a huge subject right now. People of color in wine is a big subject. Did you sense any sexism when you're trying to get to where you're going? Oh, interesting. So I'd say sexism is um, very prevalent in our mm -hmm. culture, but I don't, I, I've been grateful and I've been successful and I've had mentors and I've worked for men, I've worked for women and I've had a really good time. So I haven't, I haven't had very many roadblocks. I've always worked hard and just gotten And just through. did your work, did your work. Yep. It's, um, it's a subject that's, uh, that I get some absolute, yeah, I've had a lot of problems getting to where I'm going and what I'm trying to do. And the others like you have not had any 
um, the same conversation with people of color. Uh, and I, I wondered if maybe you have an, inf- an opinion of this that, yeah, the industry was a lot of white males. I mean, look at the, the Napa Valley Vintners Association in the Every, 60s. Everything was a lot of white males. <laughs> That's <is> true. <laughs> I guess you're right. So, but the question I ask sometimes is it, is it just the nature of the industry, the aristocracy of the industry, the unapproachability of the industry? Uh, you know, I have a young woman that just started, uh, she was an intern in my office. She did all my talking points for podcasts like this one. And she ended up getting so enthused and inspired by the guests that she just got accepted to Cornell Enology School, started, I think, today. Yay. Yeah. So Exciting. She, so it's really kind of cool. I'm very proud of that. Um, but do you think that there were the barriers to the industry were established or just the industry, just sort of this sort of empty, not empty, but an industry that's hard to approach because we don't know anything about it. It's romantic, it's aristocracy, there's snobbery in it, there's... Um, as far as for women, I th- yes. you know, I think that it's a lot of hard work, but I don't, I don't, uh, in my generation, I don't see roadblocks that keep women out you know, not at least not as not beyond what our culture already does. Yeah. You know, I it's a big subject, women in wine, but I will celebrate the day when I'm not called a woman, a female winemaker, when I'm just a winemaker. Mm-hmm. Everyone makes a big deal about women in wine, and it it kind of sounds I'm glad like you said that. But it kind of sounds I have like to ask the questions though. But it, it if we didn't, we if we weren't so surprised that a woman was doing something. And we just called him a winemaker and just said, hey, she makes wine or hey, she manages a vineyard. That'll that'll be the win when we're just a regular old winemaker. What do you think that is? I couldn't have been soon enough. If it was yesterday, I'd I mean, be. If, the press, if the press continues and the conversations continue and the, the, the articles continue, yeah, let's, is it ever going to change? Let's stop them. This, I can stop. We can stop that. I won't ask that. I'm going to cut that out of the Yay! podcast. <laughs> Small gonna, victory. We're going to remove it. Um, when you're talking about light, light-handed, which I think is a great term, besides Candace, um, <laughs> that <laughs> I'm going to look her up. <laughs> yeah. So, the organic movement, biodynamic, you know, like like Anthony Bourdain said when it shows, it's always been farm to table. It still is farm to table. There's a farm and there's a table, and then somewhere in between. Yes, you know, we try to wonder why. Tomatoes that go down the five freeway at the bottom of the truck aren't smushed. We do try to figure that out. But, you know, it was always organic. The Bordelais were organic. The Burgundians were organic. Everybody was organic. You didn't have herbicides, pesticides in, 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 the, in the vineyard before. Before and what, now, World War II? Yes. Yeah. The Bordelais invented copper sulfate, what, in 49 or something, or 42. Mm-hmm. So for me... It's not an excuse for a wine to taste like it cow dung. In other words, maybe because you don't see the retail side, like the stuff I used to taste all the time, like, oh, there's organic, it's about dynamics. Like, yeah, but it tastes like crap. I mean, seriously. Um, what's your what's your take on the organic movement, biodynamic movement? Do you mean in wine or yes, in vineyards? In wine. In wine. So like a natural wine? Yeah, so define that. Right. There's no broad definition. Um I think it's an interesting pushback. Like you said, you know, when referring to Napa Valley wines on a shelf and you get something that can taste very similar. So the natural movement is a pushback to that and wanting to get back to terroir. But I think the problem is in a natural wine, if you can't make it clean or well done, you've lost terroir and you've just given up to sort of the spoilage microbes. So, uh, you know, that's not good either. But I'm a big fan of organic <laughs> grapes, organic farming, mm-hmm. non uh, GMO is controversial, but like not manipulated within a laboratory. You know, having sort of the pre World War II, sort of the natural as intended grapevines, grapes, farming, and wine. I'm trying to figure out the, the difference between. And I haven't got a straight answer. I had a guy on the show who makes uh, GMO. Um, anti-hangover probiotic. And then, again, it's true. Interesting. <laughs> yes. And the next day I had um, a, 
a, an organic rum maker. Um, and I, I asked the question, both of them, I said, can you tell me the difference in a chemically or, or, or lab modified gene that grows a corn or a grape or whatever versus one that was hybrided, like there's 40,000 strains of wheat in America, mm -hmm. all of them hybrids, all of them mm -hmm. just cross pollination or whatever. Is that, do you, do you, have you thought about that? I mean, like, so cross pollination doesn't, you know, bother me. It's, you know, how we got Cabernet Sauvignon. Right, but exactly. It's more of the um, seeds with BT or Roundup Ready. You know, that's the GMO or highly processed seed and plant that I'm not interested in, which in grapevines we don't have currently, and so at least not widely. I don't consider sulfur or sulfites um, necessarily unorganic or well, biodynamic, but because I think that's natural. Sulfur additions yeah, to wine. I think that's normal. It is partially, as we know, part of the process of make, making wine. It comes from fermentation as well. Sure. But um, without the other things, like you said, organic farming, no pesticides, insecticide, do you have a, a yield issue by growing grapes that way? No, uh, we don't have a yield issue other than we're on a Hillside with little soil, little yeah. <laughs> water, lots of elements, hail, wind. But so what it comes down to for me is generally, I won't speak for everyone, but organic, non-organic, biodynamic, people are using some form of a pesticide, insect, not necessarily an insecticide, but like a fungicide, maybe a herbicide. There are organic ones. There are non-organic ones. There are alternative products that are maybe used in biodynamics. Um, but they're spraying their vines. And when I look at what I'm spraying, what I'm asking my vineyard workers to use, what I'm walking amongst, and then what I'm consuming, I want it to be the safest version. Mm -hmm. So we farm organically here at Cornell. We, we tend towards some biodynamic philosophy, but we are not biodynamic. We care for our soil, we care for our vines, and we care for our employees. And so being natural and you know, taking every opportunity not to spray, but then if we have to spring safe chemicals, and I'm sure that can be argued every which way, but that's hugely important to us. The same as when we bring the fruit into the winery, I'm not making additions that are going to impact the wine or turn it into something that's manipulated because I don't want to drink that. I don't mm -hmm. want to take that home mm -hmm. and share that with my husband. Uh, the Cornells have five children, and when those children grow up, they want them to be able to consume what they've made and what they've put their energy into, and they want to feel good about it. They want to share it with their friends and feel good about it. So, Can you tell when you go to a restaurant and you open a bottle of wine or go to a friend's house and you kind of go, oh, my God, this has been played with? Yeah, I think there's definitely uh, a I level that you can tell, you know. And it's it's along the same lines of loss of terroir. It's sort of just tastes sort of dead and kind of like anything else. How do you how do you explain that idea to a novice who, who's learning about wine? And you use the word we use the ter word terroir quite frequently. It has no firm meaning. In other words, just you don't point to a character of a wine and say that's terroir. And we we would, but I mean, you don't say that raspberry character is is called terroir. Do you have those conversations? And like, how do you explain? It? Like, what do you? How do you explain terroir? Besides the earth and the wind and the soil. And well, terroir to me is everything that touches that grape. So over time and through practice, you can, you can learn terroir. But it's not something that sticks out like a color. You know, right. it's something you have to experience. So like the Cornell terroir, lower alcohols, higher acids, and then the layering of herbal and fruit notes that we get. I mean, if you taste the wine, you know it's from Cornell. But then, as you asked earlier about the different terroirs in Napa Valley, you can taste Spring Mountain, you can taste Rutherford, you know, all these different places, but it's, it's an experience and it's everything that touches that grape. The sunshine, you know, the climactic conditions that year, the soil, the uh, manipulation of the vineyard manager and crew, all the way into the winery. That's a great 
comment, the vineyard manager never thought about that. Because <clears throat> I always said terroir certainly is the winemaker's history and experience of what they've done all this time. You know, there's not a lot of winemakers that go into vineyards. No. You'd be surprised. <laughs> really? I mean, some of them do more and more, but for a long time in the American wine industry, it's been two different professions. Have you seen this show, this uh, Apple TV show called Drops of Gold? I just heard about God, it this morning and watched a trailer. I'm very excited. Oh, we binged the two days. We watched the whole thing. Nice. Like, My coworkers <laughs> have been holding out on me and they've both started it. So yeah, We will spoil it for you, but it's fascinating drama over wine. Uh, clearly, it's... I'll say this, that it's, it comes down to the story mm -hmm. and, and the history and the sort of the conversations around wine. And it kind of sort of explains why if you go to the Parthenon and have an Italian wine and then you try to drink that same wine in America, the same vintage, and you kind of go, it doesn't taste the same. Right. Or right? the Pantheon. You see, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. That too. So <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a great show and I think you should, you should watch it because it'll, for me, it explains a lot about what we're trying to explain, what we're trying to tell the stories. And, my, and the highlight that years ago we came up here was another couple. We're sitting at, I think it was Clopagas. We're having two different Cabernets from two different vineyards, same vintage, same winemaker. And I was told by that moment by this person that you guys are full of shit. That, you know, what you say about wine and the complexities and you're talking about cedar and leather and all those things. There's oh, BS. the wine tasting Sort of the, the analytics were yeah. were full of shit. And I said, okay. I said, you're looking at two different wines right now. Same vintage, same location, same grape. Are they different? Yes, they're different. Okay, so the only difference is you can't explain the differences, but you acknowledge that they're different. Well, that same person watched Drops of God. Mm, and then understood it. Yeah, went to this. Actually, that night went to the restaurant, ordered a house Bordeaux, and started writing down notes about what... <laughs> What character? Amazing. You know? I can't wait to watch it. <laughs> so, but it, for me, the, the history of wine is not just in those descriptions. I, I fight the swirling and sniffing to get to the roots of the stories. The, the, the Cornells bought this property because of the history of them proposing here. Uh, the fact that they have five kids and in the future they're going to want to be stewards of this land so that they can be handed off to the next generation and the next generation. Right. Those are the stories. And that's what wine is. It's a bottled up story. And what I'm afraid of with consumers is that we don't see that when we buy Apothic Red <laughs> or, you know, Snoop Dogg's Cali Red. Oh, I don't know. Snoop Dogg <laughs> has a good story. but <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I also think there's another version of wine. And more to the reason I'm in this industry is that when you go to your friend's house with a bottle of wine... And everyone comes to the table and has food and shares that. That's like a moment that you sit and you enjoy each other. So, so why is that though? Why is it wine? Because wine's it? fun. <laughs> and no, I mean like you could do it with bourbon and you'd be all passed out by the time you guys uh, are done. What well, is it? Wine also captures a vintage and it captures, I, I mean, it's so connected with the land. That's yes, it. we've gotten off course a little bit with heavily manipulated wines, but truly our intention every year is to capture a piece of history and to capture the year and a place and put it in a bottle and enjoy it years from now with people we love. And I like that it's a piece of history because it is time. Yeah. Like Jim it's, Croce, time in a bottle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads me to another question, it's sort of a philosophical question, that, and I, it's a very hard question to answer, and I get very crazy answers because of the direction that is, Let's pretend that profitability had nothing to do with this. Does it have something to do with this? Oh, so then Sorry. we don't have to worry about that. We have, that's Sorry. the best answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all seriousness. <clears throat> all seriousness aside. So, <laughs> but no, I, you get different questions because obviously profitability drives the Josh's and the, like we said, some of those other brands. And let's not, you know, let's not gloss over this. If you go to certain retailers, you know, Snoop Dogg's Cali Red is at eye level, the middle shelf, you know, that's illegal in the booze business to buy that space, but something that got there somehow, because it's certainly not the nicest wine on the shelf. So do you think it would be a different, we would taste different things? Would it be more cognizant of the terroir? Would it be more cognizant of the grape variety? Would it be more cognizant of, you know, the region it's from? Would, if, if we weren't worried about the profit? 
I think we'd all do a lot of things better if we weren't worried about the profit. I mean, but that's a constraint. It's a reality. Uh, you know, I think every winery brand has different goals. Some winery brands have a large consumer base and they want to make a product that tastes consistent. You know, that's no different than Coca-Cola. It's unfortunate that maybe that's not the intention for wine. And so maybe some people react differently to that. But what we do here at Cornell is much removed. We, we have one vineyard that we work from and we choose to express that. So putting the whole industry together and lumping small producers in with big producers, we just have such different goals yeah. and such different demands and, and purposes. You know, I think it's great that people can buy a $15 bottle of red wine because they, they want to enjoy red wine also and they want to take it home and share it and they have a different budget than some other people. So who am I to judge that? I made a living on those fifteen dollars wines. Yeah, I so. mean, <laughs> but that's just, that's just, look. You know, you know the business is, you know the business. So when you're what? 21 and you just want a bottle of red wine, you got to start somewhere. You got to grow into your more expensive wines. Well, you know, I look at, I have this funny, iron, ironic comment, and that is. Uh, particularly the millennial generation loves, and I have three of them. I grace three of them. Be careful, they're great, careful. Hard, they're hard I workers. I am a millennial. And, and I, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing that surprises me now, they're talking about older millennials. I'm like, oh my God, they're That's already right. older. I am an they're, elder they're, millennial. They're, they're already older. And my daughters are as well. And I don't mean that derogatorily. I'm just saying, that's a generation that's interested in, in organic. It's you know farm to table. My, the, the experiential food, experiential wine is a very important part of the generation. I taught my grand my uh, my son-in-law about you know fine champagne, and it's cost me a fortune to keep him keep him that way. But they also drink White Claw. Yeah, you know something for everyone. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know that's a very open-minded comment to say because I, I fight this like White Claw. How can you drink White Claw? I got champagne here anyway. So well, yeah, different different uh, events require different beverages. How do you, how do you explain the the so interesting generationally? Like I said, my son-in-law loves champagne now and make sure I have it. Um, and some, we went through bottles and James and wine coolers. My dad sold, you know, Boone's Farm at his wine shop along next to Matus and, Lan and Lancers. And then you have these sort of spikes in, in, in the wine consumption, like Sancerre is hot right now. I mean, yeah, Cap, 10 years Cap ago, Franc Sancerre. is hot right now. And, you know, it's fads. It's just like anything. Well, why it's fads trends. happen, do you think? Is it well, consumer? Some, something gets buried and isn't around, and then someone discovers it and makes it cool again, you know? It, That's went, it. it went viral. You, you said something very important. It makes it cool again. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, I know Sancerre. So I went to a restaurant with my cousin the day. It was a Spanish restaurant, tapas restaurant. He ordered a Sancerre. And the woman was like, well, we don't have Sancerre here, you know? And I use that joke all the time, but it's, it wasn't a joke. It was real. But I just wondered, you know, I watched it, and when I tasted wine on Tuesdays for 35 years, um, it was sort of a temperature gauge of what's going on in the marketplace, two temperature gauges. One was what's hot and what the salesman was forced to sell at that moment, he mm. or she. Also, what was slow to sell and needed to get mo moved out of the warehouse to make room for the stuff that was selling. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and so I got some great deals on Merlot, let's say, Merlot, or, you know, and then Sancerre came in, and I couldn't touch it with a with the – Merlot was a classic example. You know, the three main influences in wine consumption in America, the uh, Mediterranean diet from Morley Safer in 1990, mm -hmm. when they announced that red wine clears your arteries out mm -hmm. uh, sideways, right? And, of course, the um, Judgment of Paris. Ah, uh, yes. So tell me about the Cornell's inspiration to do this. I mean, we talked about it a little bit, but Wine was part of their family sort of ambiance? Yes. So, obviously, Henry and Vanessa grew up separately uh, in two different households. But Henry Cornell, uh, his mother always had wine. You know, she was a single mother. And, you know, they didn't have a bunch of excessive money to, to have wine all the time. But on Sunday dinners, there was wine. And, you know, brought everyone together. It was something he always remembered fondly. And then Vanessa, she actually grew up with a father who taught her all about wine. And so it was always something in their lives. And when Henry moved back to the United States, he had also a love affair with California. So um, came out here, bought the property, and has been so committed to making this into the winery it is today. Wow. He spent uh, the first 
13 years or so because he bought the property in 2000. And he planted the vineyards. He experimented with wine. He refined the style that he wanted to put in bottle. And it took that long to get there. Um, and in 2013, he was so proud of the wine that came off this property. And that's when he started the wine label. So the Cornells come out and visit us, you know, several times a year. And occasionally we're lucky enough to have one of their kids along. The last time we had uh, one of their kids. And it just brings so much life to the property when their kids come and when they're here. And, you know, we, have, we remember why we're doing this because they are so committed to this project and feel so passionately about how we farm, how we take care of the property and the land and and also the wine we're putting in the bottle and how we present it to customers. So That's pretty refreshing. It is. It's, it's refreshing and it, it's, you know, we're under... Uh, or we were working together towards this really passionate goal that the Cornells are putting forth. And it it draws us all into work every day and makes us excited That's, to be here. It's inspirational because yeah. so much of the lifestyle here is the attraction. And it sounds like that's not what he was looking for, was like to have build a magnanimous chateau somewhere. It, well, exactly. If you look around, we're, <laughs> it's not really... we're pretty, we're a dirt road. <laughs> pretty, pretty rustic. <laughs> our, this house here was built in the 70s. And um, yeah, it's sort of da- back to the roots. So we always say we're trying to make a classic wine from this untamed terroir. Yeah. So we haven't polished everything up. You know, the, the vineyards were planted into the hillsides. We carved them, you know, they're very small blocks, half acre blocks, as we examine the soil and we just put them right over the existing uh, rolling hills. So, Are there terroir differences just amongst these vineyards here that you've... So terroir is an interesting way to ask the question because I view the entire property as, you know, sort of a one one terroir, but there are massive differences in soil, in aspect, in vineyard plant material, in row spacing and vine spacing. Uh, so every little block that I have here is farmed differently. Wow. And we look for different things. They respond differently when we, you know, offer inputs, irrigation or otherwise. And we have to be really attentive because things change quickly up here in the mountains. Things can get dry quick. Hail can come quick. Rain can come at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. We've even had frost up here in the hillsides, so. It says icy roads on the way up here. I know, actually. right? Well, we get a little of everything, which makes it fun, but also makes it hard. We were in Bordeaux in 2018, and we left. <clears throat> we were headed to Nice or something, and right behind us was a hailstorm. Uh, and it literally cut a swath through the middle of the vine. In other words, you, this, this vine was untouched, and that row was untouched, but the five in between... It was so defined. It was crazy looking. It's devastating. Just stripped it. Just stripped it. Have yep. You had hail here before? We have. We don't generally get hail that strips shoots and leaves, but we definitely get hail that affects bloom. Wow. So we get less fruit, and that's devastating. You used a term on, on, on your website, which I thought I had coined myself, but now I guess I'm not. <laughs> uh, an honest glass of uh-huh. wine. Uh-huh. Define that again. Uh, well, to me, I didn't put it on our website, but oh, to you didn't me, do it. So, that means... I, I'm redeemed. It's, I can still use it. <laughs> um, I, that's, I guess, what we try to do here if you distill it down. So we're trying to grow grapes that express this property and this site. And even when I blend the different blocks together, I never lose sight of trying to express mm-hmm. this rustic terroir, which, you know, we put in our wine. We we try to showcase the tannin that comes from here. I do not try to gloss over that. We try to showcase the, you know, bright, lively acid that comes from here. I don't manipulate that. So, you know, what you're tasting in the glass is what grew out here on the property. So we're going to get to that right now. Sure. Um, but he said something very important that I want the listeners to understand is that acid content, particularly for Napa, because what I think's happened is the shores, the sh- man, I cannot speak. The shelf version of Napa Valley wines right now is sort of void of that structure and that acid. And it's fine if that's the consumer palate's looking for. In fact, I read an article and I was sort of angered by it where the author was saying that Napa Valley and California winemakers are missing the boat. They're not asking the right questions of the consumer. Burn. And and 
producing wines that they want to produce instead of the wines that we want them to produce. Mm. And that kind of gets away from the whole idea of an honest glass of wine representing where it's from. So, and I think a lot to do with that is the structure of the, and the acid structure. That it's so easy to gloss over and let people just have nice, bright fruit. And Yeah, that's interesting. I We have talked about that here before, and we always come back to making wines that we want to drink and wines that we feel come from this property. And I, I'm sorry to say this, everyone, but I never consider the consumer's palate. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I don't think you should in the sense I, of... I just couldn't make wine that way because, you know, I, I think one of the most fascinating things about wine is when you put together a tasting group and you taste certain wines, the guy to your left may love it, the person to your right may hate it, and there's just no way to please everyone, so why try? That's the best. So what are we tasting? So what we have it? two wines here. This is our Cornell Estate Cabernet. It's the reason I come to work every day. Every wine is made to go into this, so every lot is made to go into this wine. And um, a lot of them make it, and some of them express a little bit differently and go into some of our other wines. We have our 2019 and our 2020 Cornell Estate Cabernets. <coughs> wow. So a little mini vertical. How fun. Wow, the color's amazing. That, um, love the purple edge. It's just crazy young, though. No? Yeah, so 20, uh, we did just release 2020, but 2019, a week ago, was our current release. Mm -hmm. Now 2020 is out. And both beautiful vintages. Um, the end product is great. The 2019 was a little bit warmer and has some of that seductive sort of luscious fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, still has plenty of green notes coming through that mm -hmm. are natural for our property. And then the 2020, a challenging year, but was shaping up lovely. And then um, we got, we were lucky to get a few lots picked and into the winery before our fire came through. So it's a very small vintage, but we're happy to have some. The, the, the lingering, I mean, I still taste it. It's been like a minute. Yeah. Right? That's from the acid, the types of acid, the structure of the acid. I think it's the structure and uh, it's this hillside. I mean, mm. mountain hillside wines are intense, long lasting. This has a lot of bottle life. Of bottle length in it too. You can see this really developing. Yeah. One of the other interesting thing why one of the other interesting things here is the wines go through such ups and downs. They evolve so dramatically in bottle. So I don't think our wines come around really until they've spent ten months in bottle post bottling. And there's just sort of this time that the wine needs to come back together, and then it starts to mellow out. And about three years after bottling, it becomes very beautiful and silky. Wow. One of my first vintages here in 2018, we were blending the wines post-harvest and all through the aging, sort of working together and putting our, our product together. And I just thought, I can't do it. The wines are too tannic. And every time we blended, I wanted to rip my teeth out. And I thought, I don't know what I've done this is the most tannic thing I've ever tasted. But by the time the wines were in bottle for a year, all of that tannin was absorbed. And the wine is beautiful mm. and silky. And it's like it was never there. I question myself sometimes if I was well, dreaming it's hard to it predict, up. right? I mean, it's, people always ask, how can you tell if a wine's going to last? And it's like, well, it's, it's hard to know exactly, except the winemakers, you know, got the structure built in from the beginning. But really what's going to happen as, and my dad would say, it's a living thing that we know it's not. But because it is metamorphosis going on. Yeah. Do, I do mean, you think it's, it's a bottle shock thing or it's just, a, it's just the evolution of the wine? I think it's the evolution of the wine here. So certainly once the wine goes into the bottle, there's, that's a bit of a the colors are tumultuous period for the wine. It gets, you know, shoved inside this tiny bottle and a cork put in and a burst of oxygen um, when it's done. But after the wine mellows out, it's definitely everything coming together and the wine evolving um, that gives you those changes throughout the life. You know, the, the fruit wine. and the nose, is, they're different, right? 
Say that again. Like they're a little bit different between the two venues. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Different but blends and different seasons. Yeah, that's what we're trying to express. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like my dad used to say, don't shake the, you know, when I make a martini, don't shake it. You're going to bruise the gin. I'm like, yeah, okay, dad, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a fascinating conversation and so impressed with uh, with your expression of what you're trying to do here, what, what Cornell is trying to do. And I think we need more Napa Valley wineries to express where they're from because I think it's got, you know, it's arrogant to say something like this, but it, we need to express it more than what's being expressed. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a lot of people out there doing, expressing their terroir, and it just comes with a little bit more of a price tag, and it's not always attainable. So, But I encourage you, go experience more of that because it's it's definitely out there. And any future plans for varietal tests? Um... Um, we have nothing crazy in the future, but I am, I do have two more plantings and I'm planting a little more Merlot and a little more Cabernet Franc, which I am excited about. Um, you know, maybe we have some exciting things coming out in our product lineup. And uh, really, I think we're just excited to get the whole place planted again and get back to farming and uh, making wine. Make good wines. Yeah. Cabernet Franc's a tough animal and it, it can be pretty diverse when it comes to what ends up in the bottle. So that's yeah, I just challenge. read an article today calling it a winemaker's wine, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. But it's not up to me. It's up to the property, and I'm just going to shepherd it through. Well, thank you for your time today and coming up, and we appreciate the late notice. Uh, this will be a very interesting conversation for our listeners to have, and, and good luck with all the things. Hope to see you again and do it again. Yeah, it was nice to meet you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul Callum Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. Folks, have a great time out there in the wine world. Cheers.